welcome to our continuing series of lectures on fundamentals of transport processes where we were going through how one does shell balances to get a differential equation for the concentration temperature or velocity fields. These are typically partial differential equations and then how go one goes about solving them. We have seen so far two different kinds of solutions. One is uh, similarity solutions and the other is uh, separation of variables procedure. Uh, what I had solved for you originally were was a Cartesian coordinate system where we just had a flat surface in the x y plane and the z direction was perpendicular to the surface. And as you recall, we took a small differential volume element with surfaces at locations z and z plus delta z. These surfaces were surfaces perpendicular to the coordinate z and they were surfaces of constant area. And therefore, the differential equation that we ended up with was fairly simple in form. Okay, if you recall here, it just had one time derivative and a second order derivative in the spatial coordinates. This is in a Cartesian coordinate system where the, 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 the coordinates themselves are straight lines and the planes, the surfaces perpendicular to the coordinates are surfaces of constant area. In the last lecture, we had looked at how to do this for a coordinate system where the surfaces are no longer flat. One would think that even if the surfaces were curved, one could still use exactly the same approach. Use a Cartesian coordinate system and in that coordinate system, the surfaces uh, will be defined by some equation and then solved in that equation, in that coordinate system. It turns out that that is more complicated. It is easier to consider surfaces such that the boundaries are surfaces of constant coordinate. There the boundaries just become surfaces at which the coordinate is equal to a constant value. However, the differential equations turn out to be more complicated and we had looked at one such a cylindrical coordinate system in the previous lecture. Cylindrical coordinate systems are widely used in, in all pipe flows. Uh, uh, the, the coordinate system is a cylindrical one. So, any time that you have transport of mass, momentum or energy in a pipe and annulus and other such configurations, the natural coordinate system to use is the cylindrical coordinate system. Okay. So, in this cylindrical coordinate system rather than having the x and y coordinates, one has instead the radial coordinate which is basically the distance from the origin. Okay. The distance from the origin is a constant at this boundary surface. Okay. So, at this surface of this pipe for example, in the cylindrical coordinate system, the distance from the origin is a constant. Therefore, it is convenient to use this distance from the origin as a coordinate. And once you have chosen the distance from the origin or the radial distance as a coordinate, the differential volume that has to be chosen is a volume having constant coordinate, okay. a volume which is perpendicular to the direction of variation of the coordinate. In this particular case, the distance from the origin is the coordinate r okay. and therefore, the coordinate system that I will choose is a system, I am sorry, the differential volume for carrying out the balance is a volume between two surfaces of constant r. Okay. So, the boundary is at the location r is equal to capital R and the differential volume okay, will be between surfaces of constant r at the location r is equal to some r and r is equal to r plus delta r. Okay. So, therefore, in this cylindrical coordinate system, the surfaces that are chosen are surfaces at r and at r plus delta r. Along the axis of course, the, the coordinate that you will choose is, okay, is what is called the z coordinate along the length direction 
for the present we will assume that there is no variation in that direction okay so we have basically a differential volume okay bounded by two cylindrical surfaces one at r and the other at r plus delta r okay and the other and bounded by two flat surfaces in the direction along the axis okay this is very often called the z direction along the axis and r is the distance from the center in the plane of the, the, the cylinder. So, therefore, we will to choose two coordinates at the location r and r plus delta r in the z direction between uh, 0 and l. Okay. There is no variation in the z direction therefore, that volume will just be equal to l. So, we went ahead and did the energy balance for this curvilinear coordinate system. Okay. The change in energy in a time delta t is the change in energy density times the volume which is basically 2 pi r delta r times l. 2 pi r is the circumferential uh, length, the length of the perimeter times the thickness delta r is the area times the length along the axis l is the total volume. Okay. So, that change in energy in time delta t is equal to q r what comes in at the surface okay, what comes in at the surface r at r minus what goes out at the surface at r plus delta r. What comes in is the flux times the surface area of this curved surface. The surface area of the curved surface is 2 pi r times l at the location r at the location r plus delta r it is equal to 2 pi into r plus delta r times l. Since we have cho chosen curved surfaces for carrying out our differential volume, the surface area on these two curved surfaces is no longer equal and that has to be incorporated in the balance okay. plus of course any source or sink of energy within this differential volume. And now when we divide throughout by time and by volume okay. when we do divide throughout by time and by volume we get a slightly more complicated differential operator here acting on the flux. Okay. It is not just a first derivative as we had earlier when we did it in Cartesian coordinates rather it is a slightly more complicated operator okay. and then if we use the constitutive relation for the heat flux we get this as the conduction equation in a cylindrical coordinate system. Okay. So, rather than the second derivative of the temperature on the right side multiplying the thermal diffusivity, you have a slightly more complicated operator in the radial coordinate and that complication arises because surface area is changing with the radial coordinate in this curvilinear coordinate system. We had seen how to solve this for a relatively simple problem okay. heat transfer across uh, the wall of a pipe. Okay. The pipe had two radii one was the inner radius r i and the other was the outer radius r 0. The temperatures were fixed and one had to find out what is the heat flux. This is a typical conduction problem across the wall of a pipe because very uh, usually in the case of heat exchanges and so on there is transport across the wall of this pipe. The pipe is solid so the transfer is due to heat conduction alone and this transfer takes place across curved surfaces usually and it is necessary to accurately estimate what is the flux due to a temperature difference or alternatively what temperature difference is required to generate a desired heat flux across the surface to achieve the necessary transport of heat. This is at steady state, uh, there are no uh, variations in time and we will assume that there are no variations in the uh, axial direction either along the axis of the pipe. Okay. So, in that case the temperature equation reduces to a rather simple form okay. 1 by r d by dr of r times dt by dr is equal to 0. We had scaled the equation so that the temperature is 0 at the inner surface and it is equal to 1 at the outer surface okay. Okay, so that we get this boundary condition. We had scaled the radial coordinate by the inner radius. Okay, so, we get at r star is equal to 1, t star is equal to 0 
and when the radius is the ratio of the radii of the outer and inner cylinder T star is equal to 1. The solution that we get for the temperature field is a logarithmic solution okay. The solution that we get for the temperature field in this coordinate system is a logarithmic solution. It is not a linear variation as we would have got in a Cartesian coordinate system and this difference is because for a curved surface the surface area is changing with the radial coordinate okay. And finally from this we had calculated the radial flux okay. This flux itself is varying with radius but the total heat that is being transported across okay, turns out to be independent of radius. The total heat that is being transported across turns out to be independent of radius okay. That is expected because in our balance equation there was only the heat conduction term, there was no sources or sinks of heat and con consequently the total heat that is transported has to be independent of uh, the location at which you look okay. Regardless of whether you look at one particular surface which is closer to the inner surface or another one that is closer to the outer surface. The flux will change, the surface area will change in such a way that the whole total heat transported is the same. Now the in correlations the total heat is usually expressed as the thermal conductivity times an area okay times T naught minus T i divided by the difference in radius okay. So that is usually written in this fashion in order to bring it uh, approximately of the same form as you would have for flat surfaces okay. And you can see by comparing this equation and this one okay if you just compare the two this effectively defines the area for us okay. A L has to be equal to 2 pi L into R naught minus R i divided by log of R naught by R i okay. Or I can also write this as 2 pi L into R L okay the average logarithmic radius okay the log average radius okay where r l is equal to okay so this is the logarithmic average of the radius between the inner and the outer surfaces and this is what should be used for calculating the heat transfer okay from uh, across this pipe okay. The area is modified, the area is no longer uh, either the inner area or the outer area rather it is this uh, this factor okay which should be used for the area of the pipe okay. So this is the logarithmic law for the heat transfer across the wall of a pipe. As the difference becomes much smaller than either the inner or the outer radius that is if I have a pipe which is very thin okay such that R naught minus R i is much smaller than either R naught or R i. This expression will reduce to what you had for a flat surface okay. So that is the thickness becomes much smaller than the radius you will get back the expression that you had for a flat surface because log of R naught by R i okay that tends you can take the limit as this goes to uh, R naught goes to R i and you will get back the expression that you had for the heat transfer across a flat surface. So this was a simple one dimensional problem heat conduction. Next I will look at the heat transfer from a cylinder okay the unsteady heat transfer from a cylinder. Okay, the unsteady heat transfer from a cylinder. So I have some cylinder okay, of uh, okay, who 
whose radius is r and length is l. at a particular initial temperature T naught okay, at a particular initial temperature T naught okay, so the, the cylinder is entirely at a constant temperature and at time T is equal to 0 I impose the boundary condition that the temperature is equal to T 1 at R is equal to R. Okay. So, the entire curved surface of the cylinder is the temperature is changed to a different temperature T 1. Okay. This is once again a practical problem. Okay. Very often you have situations where for example, in the food product industry the you have cylinders cans if you will which are at some particular temperature and you want to cool them to a lower temperature. And so, what you would do is to immerse the, it in a, a fluid having a lower temperature and one would like to know how long it takes for the entire can to cool. Okay. So, that is uh, that's, that's a problem of practical importance. How long does it take for the entire can to reduce its temperature from the initial temperature that it was at to a lower temperature. Okay. So, this is an unsteady heat conduction problem. Okay. For the present we will assume that the entire heat conduction is happening within the cylinder. Okay the surface is always at the temperature T 1. So, that the entire heat conduction is happening at the uh, within the cylinder. Okay. There is no thermal resistance outside. So, we will assume that the temperature is a constant at T 1. The other thing that we will assume is that there is no variation in the axial direction. Okay. As I said you will have a coordinate system if I look from the, the, the top you have a radial coordinate system, the cylinder surface is at r is equal to capital R okay. and you also have an axial coordinate system, uh, an axial coordinate along the axis of the cylinder and for the present we will assume that variations are entirely in the radial direction, there is no variation in the axial direction. So, how do we solve this problem? We take a differential volume of course, with surfaces perpendicular to the direction of the coordinates, surfaces of constant coordinate. Okay. Okay. You will have surfaces at r and surfaces at r plus delta r. So, if I look at it here, I will have one surface at r and another surface at r plus delta r. Okay. The inner surface is at r, the outer surface is at r plus delta r and it has a length l. Okay. And as I said if you do the balance you will get back the same balance equation that I had got back earlier. Okay. Partial t by partial t is equal to alpha 1 over r d by dr of r plus if there are any sources or sinks of energy. In this particular case we consider that there are no sources of or sinks of energy and therefore, this thing is equal to 0. Now, what is the boundary conditions on this? Okay. At r is equal to r, we know that T is equal to T 1. Okay. Now, note that r is equal to 0 is just a point. Okay. r is equal to 0 is just a point. Okay. Within this is the, the location along the axis. So, it is just a point in the radial plane. Okay. At this you require that the temperature has to be finite. Alternatively, uh, the derivative of the temperature has to be equal to 0. In this particular case, we have only one boundary and that boundary is at r is equal to capital R. Okay. We have a second order differential equation and strictly speaking, we need two boundary conditions. The other boundary in this case 
is at the origin itself at r is equal to 0 ok. The other boundary is at the origin itself at r is equal to 0. What should be the boundary condition there ok. So, this is a symmetry condition it is there is no physical boundary at the location r is equal to 0 ok because it is just a homogeneous solid. If I had something like a wire or something at that location which was heating up the solid then there would be a real boundary there would be a physical boundary. In this case it is just one homogeneous material everywhere. So, there is no physical boundary. However, there is a boundary condition that is required by symmetry at this location ok. So, if I were to take a cut across ok the cylinder ok. If I were to take a planar cut across the cylinder ok. Okay, if I were to take a planar cut across the cylinder ok. Let us say I take it along a plane ok along a plane ok I cut the cylinder along a plane ok. Then I will get temperature profiles as a function of radius r ok. On the right side is the distance from the, the axis in, uh, in, in rightward. On the left side is the same distance after all r was defined as the distance from the axis. So, it is the same distance from the axis ok. If I plot the temperature profile on the right side for example, I could get different sorts of temperature profiles ok. I could imagine a temperature profile in which the, uh, okay, the temperature becomes flat as I approach the axis ok. I could imp imagine a temperature profile where the temperature becomes flat as I approach the axis. I could imagine another temperature profile where the temperature does not become flat as I approach the axis ok. These are possibilities ok on the right side alone ok. Since there is no variation around the axis in this case I have considered the system to be symmetric in that direction. So, that there is no variation around the axis ok. So, therefore, for this blue temperature profile the temperature on the other side will look something like this ok it will be symmetric about this point ok. Similarly, for the red profile if I were to rotate this temperature profile by 180 degrees on the other side I would get something that looks like this. Which of these is physical ok turns out only the blue temperature profile is physical because it is continuous at that point r is equal to 0 ok. This function is continuous because whether you go from the right side or the left side the derivative of the function is the same. So, this is a continuous function with a continuous derivative at the axis. The other one that I had imagined is actually not continuous ok. The slope from one side has one value the slope from the other side has another value ok at the same location. A function cannot have two different slopes two different derivatives at the same location. Therefore, this red profile is not physical ok. In particular if you had a discontinuity in a slope that means you will have a discontinuity in the temperature field at that point and the flux would be effectively be infinite ok because the flux is the derivative of the temperature. If you cannot define the derivative of the temperature you cannot define the flux at that point. So, in general if you have a homogeneous material the requirement is that the temperature the slope of the temperature or the derivative of the temperature has to be equal to 0 ok. That is a boundary condition that emerges from the symmetry requirement of the coordinate system itself even though we do not have a physical boundary at this location ok. Therefore, this red temperature field is not physical ok. The only physical temperature is the blue one ok at the axis at r is equal to 0 ok. So, therefore, you require this from the coordinate system itself ok. Once again this is because there is no physical boundary at this location. If I did have a physical boundary such as a thin wire or something like that 
you could have a non-zero slope because there will be a heat flux from that. Okay. We will come and see that a little later. Okay. In this case because it is all one homogeneous material, the boundary is only due to the coordinate system. There is no physical boundary, this becomes the boundary condition at the origin. Alternatively, another possible boundary condition is just to say that the temperature itself has to be finite at this location. And then I have an initial condition. Okay, uh, at t is equal to zero, t is equal to t zero. Okay, for all r less than r. Okay, at the initial time, the temperature is uniformly t zero everywhere. Only at time t is equal to 0, the temperature has been increased to t1 okay, at, at the boundary okay, r is equal to r. Okay. So, those are the initial and the boundary conditions. Okay. Now, we can scale the equations. Okay, we can scale the equations. Uh, the natural scaling for the radial coordinate r star will be equal to r by r. Okay because then this boundary condition becomes r star is equal to 1 and r star equals 0. Okay, those are the boundary conditions, uh, the locations of the boundaries when I scale r by capital R. Okay. How should I define a scale temperature? Okay, how should I define a scale temperature? What would you expect in the limit as time goes to infinity? Okay, you have the cylinder whose surface temperature is T1. Okay. As you wait for a very long time, you would expect the temperature to all become equal to the surface temperature. Okay. Therefore, the temperature in the long time limit will be equal to the surface temperature T1. Okay. You would expect the scale temperature field to go to 0 in the long time limit. Okay. If you recall when we had done the, the heat conduction in a finite slab, we had said that in the limit of T going to infinity, the transient part of the temperature should go to 0. Okay. The transient part is the total temperature minus the steady temperature. Okay. In this particular case, the steady temperature is just equal to T1, it is a constant everywhere. Okay. So, therefore, it is best to define T star is equal to T minus T1 by T naught minus T1. Okay. So that when T is equal to T naught, okay, uh, so that uh, at this at R is equal to R, right, this would imply that T star is equal to 0. Okay, at R is equal to capital R, this would imply that T star is equal to 0 because T is equal to T1 at the surface. Okay. And at r is equal to 0, you can scale it quite easily and you get d t star by d r star is equal to 0. Okay. And if I defined it that way, that would mean that at time t is equal to 0, t star is equal to, I am sorry, 1. at t is equal to 0, t star is equal to 1 because t is equal to t naught okay, at t is equal to 0, therefore t star is equal to 1. Defined this way, the forcing is at initial time okay, and then the temperature field evolves in time. Okay. The boundary conditions in the spatial coordinates are both homogeneous. Okay. The boundary conditions in the spatial coordinates are both homogeneous, either temperature is 0 or its derivative is 0. What is forcing this temperature field is the initial difference between the temperature in the cylinder and the temperature of the surrounding fluid. So, this problem, this is basically the transient part of the temperature. We can solve using a separation of variables procedure, almost identical to the separation of variables procedure that we had used for the heat transfer in a finite channel. I will continue in the next lecture how this separation of variables procedure is implemented. Okay. So, we will continue this in the next class.